pre-recorded from Joe's mom's basement. Welcome to another Greatest Hits Rewind episode of The Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey everyone, I'm Griffin the Intern. But you know what? We've become such good friends this week, you should just call me the Fintern. For our last Rewind show before the guys come back on Monday, let's go back to 2020 for an interesting roundtable discussion with our team of frequent contributors on how to navigate awkward money moments. Plus... Halfway through the episode, there's a great discussion with our wonderful HR friend, the evil HR lady, on how to communicate via text when interviewing for a job, so I hope you enjoy that segment as well. As I mentioned, this episode originally aired in 2020, so ignore any mention of current events. Joe and OG will be back on Monday with special guest Oscar Munoz. Oscar was the CEO of United Airlines, and we'll discuss how a health emergency didn't stop him from turning around United. Lots of takeaways for your career coming on Monday. I hope you listen. And as for me... I'll see you again in eight weeks. Enjoy. Thin turn out. Phil? Phil Connors? Phil Connors, I thought that was you. Hi, how you doing? Thanks for watching. Hey, hey. Now, don't you tell me you don't remember me, because I sure as heck fire remember you. Ned Ryerson? Bang! So did you turn pro with that belly button thing, Ned? Or no, what? Phil, I sell insurance. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and welcome to National Have Fun at Work Day. Woohoo! Yeah, baby! Oh man, we are gonna have some fun today because we are gonna talk about all of those awkward conversations about money. How the heck do you get through them and not lose friends or teeth or or both? I hate when that happens. Here today to help us add fun to those conversations, we welcome from the Afford Anything podcast, Paula Pant. And from this podcast, OG. And from LenPenzo.com, it's Bozo the Clown. I love that guy. Wait a minute. Bozo still working? How old is that guy? Like 137? Nah, we didn't get him. We just got Len Penzo. Plus, recruiting via text. Wait, that's a thing? Yeah, it sure is, LOL. So if you need to brush up on how to text professionally, we got you covered. Today, midway through the show, we'll talk to the evil HR lady, Suzanne Lucas, and throw out a magnify money trivia question. And now, the guy that thinks fun at work means playing board games. Boring, it's Joe Salcihai. Imagine if we could do podcasting, the board game. How great would that be? Hey, everybody, welcome to Friday. I'd like to be the first to welcome you to Friday. I am Joe Salcihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And we got the band back together today because coming to us from the desert... Incredibly prepared, ready to roll. It's our good friend, Paula Pant. I have never been more prepared for anything in my life. (laughs) I've spent weeks cramming for this podcast recording. It is incredible. I don't want to call you a liar, Paula, but I'm going to pull back the curtain for people. So Paula's being very facetious because I think, Paula, we told you that we'd like you on this episode about, what, three and a half minutes ago? maybe three and three quarters minutes ago. (laughs) Luckily, luckily, I think uh, your acumen, your ability to come up with it on the fly and uh, this piece are going to go hand in hand. Oh, why, thank you. I pride myself on being able to think quickly. And a guy who wishes he could think quickly, but he's way too old for that. Underneath. (laughs) underneath Los Angeles. I'm actually crying at that remark because it's so true. (laughs) Oh, I'm right behind you on that escalator, big guy. It's Led Penzo. How are you, man? I'm doing great. Hey, let me ask you a question about board games. Is Yahtzee a board game? Yahtzee is a uh, yell and scream at each other while you mark stuff on paper game, (laughs) isn't it? Hey, I've just got to brag, though. I got 612 points on Yahtzee. Holy cow. That is a ton of points. Nice job. Beat that. Stack in Benjamin's world. (laughs) Write to us. Actually, show us the proof. We want to see. I need a photo of the proof, and we'll send you some swag. And last but not least, we always call on him first, but he's sitting right across the table from me glaring like, why the hell? Who am I? What's going on here? It's Mr. OG. Shapoopy, what's up, everybody? Um, uh, uh, You were just out flying 
early this hey, morning. Boy, are my arms tired. Oh. <laughs> He's here all week. Yeah, my mom's in town, so I was able to uh, jump in the old aeroplane and uh, go do a couple of um, yeah, big, big long, uh, big long trip. We went to Waco, and then we went to College Station, and then we came back up to Dallas. That's so, fun. fun. Part of your flight mm-hmm. lessons. Uh, kind of, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, good time. We got a great show today. We got Paula. We got Len. We got OG. We got the band back together. Let's get this party started. Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins Headlines. All right, guys, our headline today comes to us from Go Banking Rates. And when I read this, I thought there is no better piece for the Stacking Benjamin show to talk about than this one. Because these are things that have happened to all of us. And nobody, I'm I'm reading each of these topics that our mutual friend Cameron Huddleston at Go Banking Rates brought up. And I thought, what a fantastic list. So we're going to borrow this from Cameron and talk about a few of these different awkward situations. And I'm sure you guys have all been in these. I'm going to read Cameron's beginning to this piece. She writes, bring up the topic of money and a pleasant conversation can quickly take a turn for the worse. But why? What is it about money that makes it such a touchy subject? You probably already know the answer. We feel so much shame around money, says Dr. Brad Klontz, a financial psychologist and associate professor at Creighton University. We feel ashamed we have too little. We feel shame that we have too much. When the topic comes up in conversation, we feel we'll be judged by others, he said. Let's uh, let's dive into these. You guys ready? Uh, Paula, we're going to go ladies first, which, mm-hmm. by the way, normally is a polite thing, but I think we're talking about awkward buddy. I have a, <laughs> I have a feeling these two yahoos are just going to ape whatever you say. There's totally yeah. <laughs> yes, what nice. Paula said. Uh, here we go. Your colleague asks how much you make. Talking about your salary can be difficult and awkward in any situation, especially this one. You're making small talk with a colleague, and he asks, so how much do you make? How do you handle that, Paula? So what's difficult about this question is that it requires me to put myself in the position of somebody who is a W-2 employee. Well, no, 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 no. Y- you no. find it. To, don't you find that in the blogger community, too? That when you go to a place like FinCon, as an example, where you're surrounded by your peers, that let's say it's at FinCon. Somebody's like, so how much do you make off of Afford Anything? Um. If it's a peer who is doing similar type of work, like if it were you or Len, I would just state the number. Well, nobody listens to the show, so why don't you just tell us right now? (laughs) (laughs) But if it were a person, like a member of the general public who does not understand the work that goes into blogging, like all, all they see is they equate it with basically writing a long Instagram post off the fly, like what I had for lunch today sort of thing then giving that number might do more harm than good in that it might give them the false impression that the work I do is overcompensated relative to the workload because of the fact that they're not in this industry and they don't understand how much work happens behind the scenes. Yeah. So that's the reason I would share it with a peer, a colleague, but not with a person who's not in the industry. And they also, by the way, Paula, don't know the moat you had to swim to get there as well. Right, exactly. Yeah, they don't know all the years of uh, of hustle, of unpaid hustle that, that went behind it. Yeah. So let's go to the W-2 employee. Len, somebody at work says, so how much do you make? I tell them. You do tell them? <laughs> yeah. Not awkward at all? Uh, no. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> you know, it's not really a, much of a secret. I mean, it's close. I mean, at least in my company, people know what your level is. If they know what your your level is in the company, your job classification, the salary tables are published. And then it's, there's a range and oh. there's a narrow range within that range that you have to be in. So it's not really that big of a secret. If it was a big range, how do you think you'd handle it? Okay. So, well, now, now you're talking workplace potential. Yeah, it'd be a little more dicey because you could cause some tension there within, if it's within your work group, immediate work team, that could cause some problems. If it's people who you don't work with generally, I don't think it makes a big difference at all. But uh, there could be some animosity there if it's within your own work team. Oh, gee, is it any different for you if it's family? Gosh, it seems worse if it's family, right? Well, 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 that's what I'm thinking. For me, like I'm trying to to think about awkward. I think if a family member asks how much I make, it's even worse. 
I just say like way more than you. <laughs> just <laughs> think of a number and put another zero on it. <laughs> now double it. In your um, face, brother. No. Right. Yeah, exactly. Steak, brother. I don't know. It's always been such like a taboo thing. And I think it's also relative to like who's asking. Like Len was saying, if it's somebody that's in a similar position or in the similar company or the step below you or the step ahead of you or whatever it is, like they're in the ballpark, right? If you make 80 grand a year and you tell somebody who makes 75,000 that you make 80 grand, like that's in the ballpark. But if you make $80,000 a year and you try explaining that to a college kid who makes 10, 50 an hour to them, there's just, there's more money than exists in all of the world. So I think it's important to kind of be in the same group if you're going to kind of start talking about that. People that are somewhat experiencing the same level of success that you might be in. Paula, does it change for you if it's family? Other than my parents, I would not tell my family simply because that could then lead to the follow-up questions of, can I have a loan? Can I yeah. borrow some money? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it could lead to that type of scenario. I feel that with my family too. I also feel there's a judginess. I mean, I've got some, the good news is most of my family doesn't care, but I have a few members of my family that just want a reason to dislike me because of the, the, what they <laughs> see is a big amount of money I make. And then there's other members of my family that really would like to put me down because I don't make nearly as much as they do. And for them, it's all a status letter climby annoying thing. You know what I mean? It just, mm -hmm. yeah, it, there's just no upside. By the way, Dr. Klon says, if you don't want to answer the question about the size of your paycheck, he says, use humor. Respond by saying something like, oh my gosh, not enough. And then nobody's really going to press you to be more specific, like deflect, just deflect. Mm -hmm. Next, we had Paula go first on that one. So Len, you're first, you're on the hot seat for this one. You asked to donate to a charity, but you don't want to. Well, that's happened a bajillion times to me that there's a particular charity that I would, I just, not because I'm not feeling generous, but because I don't believe in the charity, for example. And I'll just say, you know what, I've used my charity budget. I've already given and, and I've given all I can at this time. And I'm sorry. That's, that, that's a pretty easy one for me. And there it is. The white lie. <laughs> it is a, it yes. is a little bit of a lie. Sure. It is a little, yeah, but I think that's the easier, the, I think it's the more gracious way to, I don't think anybody wants to hear that their charity is you know, thought of as not being worthy by somebody else. Oh, gee, that you too? Or do you say, no, I don't believe in the charity? And <laughs> I don't believe in charities. Charity <laughs> begins at home. <laughs> no, I think that the, uh, the best way that I've always used to handle this is what Len said, which is, that's a great idea. And we've already been over our budget for this year. I'd love to add it to, you know, our list for next year. Just remind me, you know, when it comes up again or whatever, you know, something down the line. I'd love to help in other ways. You know, it doesn't have to be money, right? Is there something coming up? There's a, you know, there's an event of some kind that I can donate a gift certificate to or but what if hockey you're, tickets or but something. But what if you're like Len and you really don't believe in the charity's mission? It's a charity that you don't really love. You just said, well, what if there's a different way I could get involved? Yeah. Well, so maybe you can get involved in a different way. I mean, otherwise, if you totally don't want to be involved at all in it, then just, just say, gosh, I'd really love to, but we're, you know, fully committed right now. Paul, anything to add or is that your approach? Yeah, that's almost exactly my approach. I basically say, hey, at, at the beginning of every year, I set my charity budget and my giving plan for the full year. So for this year, I'm, that's already locked in, you know. What if they say, but Paula, that's why I just said happy new year to you. And it's five seconds after. the <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, We'll let that one go. Oh, gee, you're on the hot seat now. Okay. Somebody asks to borrow money from you. Who's the person? Do I get to friend it you? It says, <laughs> if it's me, I already know the answer. Uh, sorry, okay. Joe. No. Fresh out. Yes. Uh, friends or family? Yeah. So family is a little bit different than friends, to be honest. Uh, my wife and I have gone back and forth on this. I'm like, you know, what do we want to be involved in? What don't we want to be involved in? And what we decided to do was if the request was reasonable to grant it with a couple of different things in our mind. First, we had to assume that we were never getting the money back. Secondly, we have to detach ourselves from the outcome of how that person spent the money or spent subsequent money. Because when somebody owes you money and then they're like, dude, if this trip to Disney was out of this world and you're going, really? Disney? That's weird. How much was it? And that number is really close to like what they owe you. You know, you can get really mad. So you just go, I'm not getting it back. 
I'm unattached from the outcome of what you choose to do with it or in the future with your money, but this is it. You know what I mean? And we don't put those restrictions on there. But the funny thing is, is that we noticed that when we just kind of were like, oh yeah, cool, here's the money. When are you going to pay me back? Or just kind of a, it made for a real awkward like family time. Instead, everybody knows that they owe the OGs money and they don't ever ask again. So it's, <laughs> so it's, you make it as awkward as possible. It's a little self-serving, but no, we don't bring it up. But you know, are you going to ask the guy that you owe money to for more money? Probably not because sure. what's likely to happen. Yes. Right. You know, you're likely to, uh, to get reminded of it. So we have pretty much lent everyone in our family money and, uh, only once. So that's how we did it. Because nobody's paid it back. Correct. Yeah. I was going to say the, uh, the Disney story I know is not a, it isn't a fake story. Well, it's not. It's like that meme that was like the Maury meme that says like, you didn't have enough money to pay your kids tuition or something. Your new Xbox says otherwise. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, totally. But when you just like remove yourself from that, um, it just makes it so much easier. So oh, that's painful. Paula, anything to add? I take a different approach. I say flat out, absolutely not, no. And what I'll tell them is, which is true, in the past when I have loaned money to people, it has completely gone haywire upside down. Those people never paid me back. It created a lot of animosity. And then I saw them subsequently spending money on trips to Jamaica and getting new kitchen cabinets, you, but not paying me back. You seriously mm-hmm. had had that. So OG had yeah. the Disney trip. You had Jamaica and cabinets. Yeah, I had Jamaica and cabinets and it permanently ruined the relationship. So based on those experiences, what I've learned is never give a loan to anybody. And so I'll flat out tell somebody, I, based on those experiences, I have a no loan policy. I will consider a gift, but not a loan. And we must never use the L word because there should never be any indication that this is a loan. And when I say that, then they immediately back down because people feel comfortable asking for a loan. People do not feel comfortable asking for a gift, even though they have no intention of paying you back. So when I frame it as, look, I'll consider giving you a gift if that's what you're asking for, but I will not give you a loan. And they won't do it. All of a sudden, yeah, all of a sudden their request goes away. Yeah, that's amazing. I'd take it. Offer me that anytime. (laughs) (laughs) Len, speaking of that, you're not going to bring up the 20 bucks I owe you, are you? (laughs) No. (laughs) (laughs) Anything to add there? Have you had that moment? Have you had the Disney trip or the, uh, the Jamaica trip happen to you? Well, I've, it's happened a couple times. Yes. I learned what I do now is if you're going to ask me for a loan or for money, I put you through, there's a means test. I have 41 separate, uh, <laughs> items that I go through. I'm serious. I'm so, I'm serious. As a heart I, on I'm it. laughing because I know you're serious. Most, it's my second most popular post ever. It's, it's gotten over a half million page views. It's, and it, you, say, you stop by my blog. It's there. It's called dear friend. You're 41 reasons why I'm not lending you the money. And if you fail, literally all 40, 41, 41. And if you, if you fail all 41 of those, or actually if you, if you fail even one of those, you ain't getting the money. So uh, I'm going to link to that in the show notes, uh, by the yeah. way, everybody, so that you've got Len's list. That's incredible. I was going to say, I've just known you long enough to know there's probably a 36 page application, but, <laughs> but that's a means test. That's even it's better a means test. And it's foolproof. <laughs> All right. Who are we up to? We're back to Paula. Paula, you're palm sweaty. Absolutely. I'm yeah. so I'm shaking. I'm nervous. I don't know if I'll be able to come up with an answer to the next question on the fly, but <laughs> but let's try it. Okay, how about this one? This is for the Jamaica trip person or somebody back in the day before you had your current feelings about loaning money. Somebody didn't pay you back Mm. or somebody forgot to pay you back. Do you remind them? Do you say, hey, where's my cash? Do you say, how was the trip to Jamaica? Can I see pictures attached to a $20 bill? (laughs) Yeah. It depends on the relationship that I have with the person. So of the P, I'm thinking right now of... Five people who have never paid me back for money that I've, uh, various amounts of money that I've loaned to them. And two Paul's of those, like, let me get my uh, pin cushion thing <laughs> and I'm going to stab each my, one my of them. My voodoo doll. With your voodoo doll. <laughs> I thought Paul let me see how many I got on my shelf. I've got five. Yep. Five people up there. Let's <laughs> yeah. see. Who's losing a knee today? <laughs> <laughs> what did you say, Len? 
I said, I thought Paula was a faster learner than that. Five people. I know, people. right? Yeah, that took me an <laughs> You an think after the first three or four. <laughs> That's how nice Paula is, though. <laughs> yeah. uh, so of those five, two of them, I did not broach the subject because we we just didn't have that type of relationship. We didn't talk very often, even before the loan, and I just didn't feel comfortable bringing it up. Two of them, I brought it up multiple times, typically through email. Like I'll send them an email saying, hey, do you think you can pay me back yet? Or, hey, can we set up a payment plan so that you can pay me back in installments over time? So two of them, I did that. And then one of them ugh, was the worst. When I brought it up, she got super contentious and the whole thing blew up. That so. happened with me, too. Mm just immediately in my face about all the reasons why I shouldn't have even asked. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? How people will, will turn it around yeah. um, against you. Yeah. It was crazy. Right. What's that OG? I was going to say the, um, the one thing that we have used with this, that was actually helpful for everybody. I had a situation where on the phone with somebody, I heard somebody talking about how they had X dollars worth of this. Uh, wasn't a school loan per per se, but something required for their job that they had to buy. So it was uh, like equipment or something that they had to buy. And and I was listening to the story about like, oh, yes, company that they use, it's a gazillion percent interest and we're paying it back and that sort of thing. And I said, I said, well, you know, I might be interested in helping you out with that. Let me work out some numbers. And what I heard, what I, I knew the answer, right? Hey, we're getting charged 30% interest on 3000 bucks. We're making minimum payments. I said, well, I'll do you one better. I'll pay you off the $3,000. Why don't you pay me the $130 a month? We'll do it for X period of time. That'll work out to be a 10% interest rate. And by the way, the great news is that you'll be paid off with this in, you know, 36 months or whatever, as opposed to 17 years. So I kind of turned it, it wasn't a loan. It was something that I brought to them as Hey, I've got money just sitting there. I can go get on um, Prosper, one of those uh, lending application places where you give people money for, you know, whatever. I just did that internally and it's worked out fine. The way that we handled it. It did work was, out. Yeah. I was well, going to say, because I wouldn't have done this crap in a million years. Yeah. Hey, they well, already are paying on, the current pay stuff. On PayPal. Yeah. Set it up on a subscription payment on PayPal for, you know, for that period of time. So, so. it automatically comes out. Yep, never has missed one. In fact, it's almost done. It'll be done in June or something. And I was talking to the person. I said, "Hey, uh, I think you got to really trust the person to do that, though." Also, unattached from outcome, right? Like, hey, this is what I'm doing. It, it's it's priced correctly based on the risk magnitude. You know what I mean? Like, it's a return, but it's got to be a return commensurate with a junk bond, which it was. But the byproduct, I think, was number one, it, it helped the person, which I think was really great. The other thing yeah, I was talking about to them the other day, I said, hey, you know, you're almost done with this. I, I you know, I don't know anybody in your business, but maybe you just keep doing the 130 a month. And why don't you put that in your, you know, investment account or something instead? And, and, uh, and they're going to do it, which is great. So that is um, cool. You were able to help somebody, but you must have considered that a gift as well. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, yeah. there was. Going in with the same expectation. Yeah. Probably not going to get paid back. And if it does, great. You know, but we put some parameters around it so that it was more likely to happen, right? PayPal will haunt you forever if you miss a payment on a subscription. They'll just remind you every 24 hours. Len, somebody made it through your 41 point checklist. They went through the Valley of Fire. They got money from you and they didn't pay you back. Which limb did they lose? Well, that's not for me to decide. That's my Uncle Ciro Minacucci to decide. <laughs> so That just runs in the family, yeah. man. Are you kidding me? He's a Penzo. You don't loan him money. <laughs> or you don't not loan him money. Excuse me. You don't borrow money from him. What am I talking about? Yeah. Hey, I, you know, OG was talking about giving out your own loan. I did that for my neighbor. We had a block wall being put in. And on his side, I wanted to, you know, split the cost. And he didn't have the money. And I carried the... I, I gave him a, a no interest loan for uh, 200 bucks a month. I think it was for two years. Just and being a good neighbor once. Yeah. And I figured, you know what? And if he doesn't pay, I want that wall really bad. So yeah. I'm going to eat it. Uh, but I just, you know, and I hoped and kept my fingers crossed that he would pay me 200 bucks a month. And he did faithfully. God, God bless him. You know, oh, it was that's awesome. Great. So, yeah. yeah, I was gonna say we had the exact same thing at our house with a, with a fence. We had a shared fence and we were doing it anyway. We mentioned it to the neighbor, said, hey, we're going to put a fence up, you know, or redo the fence. There's already one there. So we're going to redo the fence. And she said, uh, the neighbor said, uh, well, just tell me how much our section is. 
you know, send me a copy of the invoice and highlight what our section is and we'll just pick up half of it. I said, great. So the fence comes in, built a month later, nothing. Two months later, it's Halloween. And you should see the realization on her face as you know, she had little kids as we opened the door for Halloween and it just dawns on her, damn, I owe him money. <laughs> 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 but we did, you know, she did. She just said we would and like, didn't say when. And so you kind of totally play it off, right? Like, oh my gosh, oh, I totally forgot to, and you're like, oh really? I, I, you know what? I didn't even pay attention to that. I didn't even, I, are you sure? Why, why don't you check? Go home and check. I, gosh, I swear you might've already, I'll look in my notes too, but I, I really, I think you're fine, you know? And then we got the check and then I was talking to my wife and I'm like, so how long do we wait to cash it? Do you oh, just like immediately go to the don't. bank tomorrow morning don't or do you do just kind of like, yeah, it wasn't a thing. <laughs> oh, you brought that over. Fine. I'll get to that later. So we gave it a four day hold and then we took it into the bank. So <laughs> bam. Uh, I want to go through these, these next ones fairly quickly. Uh, Len, your friends always want to split the check evenly, even though you had less. They're gluttons and they also want you to uh, pay more. Uh, you know what? I never complain and I just, I suck it up. So I, I just split it. That's fine. Just don't yeah, go out don't, with them. It's not worth the hassle. Yeah, yeah Paula? It ain't worth it. You know what I do that's terrible is I pay attention while we're all ordering and I just order to keep up with everybody else <laughs> so that we're all equal, which sometimes results in me drinking to the level of a person who's six feet tall, which just never say, goes well. Now what I want to do with me. <laughs> yeah. Really? Two bottles of cake bread? You want to rethink that strategy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure I'm sure taking Len's approach of like just deal with it and that money lost is the tax that you pay for not <laughs> having a stomach ache the next day would probably be a much wiser choice. Much healthier anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh OG. Yep. I don't ever say anything. If it given the opportunity, I'll pay the entire check. If not, and somebody is, although I did learn. Wait, wait, wait. I like have a wait, wait, wait. You said given the opportunity, you'll pay the entire check? Yeah. 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 Oh, all, right, we are all going out for dinner after no. this. <laughs> he totally but does. I do. Yeah. He does. But I don't argue with it if you say you want to split it. Like you get one chance. And I'm not going to go, no, let me pick it up. We're not going to have that game. If you're like, hey, let me throw in on that, I go, great. That's it. But I want to ask about this because, you know, I mean, we are all, we're all lucky enough to have money coming in. And, you know, I mean, I use lucky partly in air quotes, but partly not. I mean, there is some privilege there, right? But if I'm back me in college and my financial picture was horrible and I didn't have much because I didn't bring, you know, because I don't have any money. I mean, I'm working three jobs. I got no money. I remember those days about running out of gas and having to uh, walk a mile with change that I found in the seat of my Uphill. car. No, I totally both ways. Well, no, that's not that bad. An uncle Joe story, but it is bad. I mean, I seriously ran out of gas and had to walk a mile with change that I had to dig forever around the floor of my car. And luckily I found like 85 cents and then convinced them to let me borrow the, I mean, I had no money. If you would have stuck me with half the bill then, and I came there specifically knowing that I couldn't afford that, what do you do then? That's on you for showing up. Don't show up. Yeah. I mean, you're going to, you go out on the town, you got to write the check, man. I think what I would have done back in the day and, and tell me if I'm wrong here, I would have, as I'm ordering, as I'm ordering, I would have just done what seems like I'm being polite going, oh, by the way, uh, uh, those two are together and those two are together and I'm ordering by myself, whatever, like helping yeah, the waiter that's split what the I, check. That's what I've almost done. I wouldn't have said who's together. I just said, hey, put me on a separate check. That's what I'd have told the, wait, the waiter yes. or waitress. I'd said that. Just put mine on a separate check, please. Yeah, yeah. I feel the same now. Uh, I will generally try to pick up the check, but that's part of feeling gratitude about people mm -hmm. wanting to go out with me. I mean, hey, how often is that? The twice a year that happens, OG. You have to pay people to go out with I you. have to I pay know. people. That's how I feel, too. <laughs> I it's really them. weird when you're trying to split it between your kids, though. <laughs> you're like, hey, I'm going to need some uh, bread in the jar there, Nick. That's He's right. like, what do you mean, Dad? And you're like, you know what I mean. Right. You're <laughs> Free ride's over. Yeah, you're seven years old now, pal. <laughs> time to pay for your part of Applebee's. I'm right. pretty proud of myself. My One of my kids texted me today and said, hey, how much do I get paid if I uh, do this maintenance on the outside of the house, basically? I'm like, nice, trying to earn a, earn, right. earn some money. I Good like work. it. Yeah. 
Hey, before we get everybody's big takeaway on this, a big takeaway, or I guess a big rule of thumb, Paula, you're in awkward money situation. What's kind of the rule of thumb? You mean in terms of splitting the bill? No, just overall, you find yourself in an awkward money situation. Do you have like a center point that you work from? I guess if I'm thinking clearly, I suppose that the general fallback would be to state, hey, I am not comfortable with X or, hey, I feel X, you know, yeah. um, I think that I think there's a lot of power in, in just in using the phrase. I'm not comfortable with that. Yeah. Len, you. I think that the thing I would say is, you know what, it's OK to be uncomfortable talking money with strangers and maybe you're not quite immediate family. But when it comes to your immediate family, your kids don't hide anything. I think everything should be fair game because that's how they're going to learn. Yeah, love that, too. OG. Yeah, I like that. I think that all of the awkwardness is between your own ears. Most people don't care that much and will not remember. You know, you're sitting there talking about the story of, you know, how, how are we going to split this bill? And you're like, I don't want to be that guy. And, you know, uh, nobody's going to remember that 10 seconds of like, yeah, but I just had the water. So I'm going to go with the salad and water and I'm throwing in my five bucks. It's weird. And you just get it. You just go, I, I just had the salad and the water. So here's my 10. The thing is, I think what's important about that is be right. Don't order a $12 salad. Everybody else, like Paula said, everybody else is ordering $30 entrees. You've got a $12 salad. Don't be throwing in 10 bucks. Be right on your number, at least. Like if you're going to split it, so to speak. So just get over it. You guys are never going to believe this. Did you know that companies now recruit using text message? Len, you're the other old guy here. Can you believe that recruiters now will chat with you via text? No, that's amazing. Is, isn't that amazing? <laughs> that and, is totally amazing. And, and imagine, Paula, just imagine some of the conversations that some people might have via text with a recruiter that maybe they shouldn't have. I can see this being a BuzzFeed article. <laughs> Just as... I can definitely see this going haywire. <laughs> well, worse yet, the evil HR lady got a hold of it, Suzanne Lucas. She's a frequent contributor to the show. But let's talk to her about maybe cleaning up your language a little bit if you find yourself talking to a recruiter via text. And coming back down the stairs, so happy we get to talk to her again in 2020. It's our great friend, the evil HR lady herself, Suzanne Lucas, joins us. How are you? I am splendid. <laughs> well, happy new year, by the way. How do you celebrate the new year in Europe? I don't know about Europe in general, but... You can't in... speak on behalf of all Europeans? I can, but I choose not to. Yeah, right, <laughs> right, right. In German, you don't say Happy New Year. You say a good slide into the new year. Oh, I like that. Yeah. That's an interesting phrase. Gute Rutsch in Neues Jahr. So it's an interesting little difference there. So how did you sl slide? How did you slide into the new year? Well, I was all alone on New Year's Eve and I ate food and I watched television <laughs> And then I went to bed. <laughs> why Why does that sound like the perfect New Year's to me? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I mean, I thought about going down and watching the fireworks. They're only two blocks away from where I live. But then I was like, it's cold. <laughs> I'm going to bed. <laughs> and pass. Hey, I was reading the Evil HR Lady blog, like I'm known to do. And I came across this post and, and what caught me first was what was the headline that recruiting by text is a thing. And I, th I thought about that for a second. I thought I've never heard of somebody being recruited by text, but I suppose that's the new frontier. So I could be, I could be on my phone and a recruiter text me. Is that what you're saying? No, I mean, not usually like you get a, just a, a text from a recruiter out of the blue, although who knows, that may happen one day. But you get communications when you've applied for a job or whatever, and you've given them their number. Although, in fairness, 
I was going to say, you know, recruiters don't do that, but a LinkedIn message is essentially a text as well. True. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's outside of your email system or whatever. Um, and you can have that same instant response if you guys are both on at the same time. But yeah, you can use text messaging and in its different forms. It's not just a, you know, a direct text message from, you know, your phone text messaging system, iMessage or whatever it is, back and forth. But there's all sorts of different programs and such that people can use. I was thinking about this just as you were speaking, the number of times, and I don't even think about it, I will just Facebook message somebody or uh, direct message somebody in Instagram or, and really to your point, it's all text messaging and it's the same, but you say in this piece that we may need to clean up our act a little bit because when we go into textville and just texting people very quickly, a lot of us have adapted this slang that might not play so well with the new employer. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Like I say, you need to text like a grown up. And um by a grown up I, I don't mean your eighteen year old friend. I mean like your English teacher mother. It's still a business communication. You know, we kind of went a little bit casual with email and every once in a while I get emails from people written in text speak as well. And I'm just like, no. Yeah. No. And, and and give me some examples of that. Like I'm thinking of the letters you are instead of your, maybe uh, 15 emojis instead of none. Yeah, let's not do that. Let's let's do none. No, actually, I like emojis. <laughs> <laughs> but it's something that you need to be much more familiar with someone before you use them. You know what I'm saying there? It, no, absolutely. Keep it very professional. Use more precise language instead of the relaxed language. You also mentioned then your next point here, Suzanne, is that people often will go back and forth very quickly via text, but this is a professional thing. So you got to kind of give people a little time. Yeah. And I think that that's important. And especially from the recruiter standpoint, you know, if I text you and one of the things that I find annoying about a lot of text messages, I mean, I think it's good, but it's also annoying. is a lot of systems you can see if someone's read your text. Yeah. So you're like, uh, you read it, why haven't you responded? We need to make sure that we're not demanding things that we don't have any right to demand. I don't work for you yet. <laughs> and even when I do work for you, you don't expect everyone to respond immediately. If I text the candidate when that candidate's at work, they may have seen it come up on their phone, but they also don't want to formulate an answer while they're sitting across from their current boss or they want to take their time and think about something, which is fine. We shouldn't expect immediate responses. That said, most people will respond much more quickly to a text than they will to an email. Uh, But still, I get your point that just because they read it, they might have to loop in other people. I mean, there might be there might be some investigation that they're doing. They're trying to say the right thing. I've had that before, too. I'm like, just give me give me give me a little room to breathe before we right. Right. Yeah. Next up, you say to give people options. I'm in the middle of a piece like that myself with uh, negotiation with somebody. And they did this literally, Suzanne, 10 minutes ago, said, hey, would it be easier to jump on a call or should we keep this going by email? I like that a lot. Yeah, I do too. That works out better because people have strong preferences. I mean, personally, I think text messaging is a gift from the gods. (laughs) It's like... So often there are things that you don't need to call someone about. You know, you can just quickly get an answer and that's amazing. But not all people feel that way. And some people prefer speaking to to texting and we should all be sensitive to each other's needs. I think you're going to find some generational differences as well. Yeah. The younger folks, um, our Gen Zs especially, have grown up with phones in their hands. My daughter writes papers on her iPhone instead of typing them on her wow, laptop. Wow, really? I mean, she will type them on her laptop, but I, I have seen her. Sure. I cannot imagine writing a thousand words with my thumbs. But for her, you know, no big deal. For someone like me, if we're going to have a conversation or if I need to write an in-depth answer, I want to do it somewhere I can use a keyboard. So, you know, if we're doing 
WhatsApp, I have that on my laptop too, and I can type out a full paragraph response. If we're using just, you know, Apple iMessage or whatever, I got to do it on my phone. That's going to be a pain. And I'm also thinking that um, it depends on how long a conversation we want to have. And don't get me wrong. I would never do like a paper like your daughter does on the phone because it's a it's more of a long form thing. And I've found that when there's mis um, either misconceptions or um, people reading stuff into a text that I didn't mean, like that happens a lot more in text than it does via phone because of the the form. It's easier for people to misconstrue what I'm saying or misconstrue my uh, my intent. And I found that when I've had trouble communicating with people, that's been, that's been the case. I'm using the wrong avenue of communication. Yeah. And it's important, I think, to think about all of those things. And for me being an old fuddy duddy, you know, I wouldn't advocate just hiring someone based on their text messages alone, <laughs> True, but it can be part of the recruiting process, part of what you're um, using to reach out to candidates you're still going to want to talk with them or um, you're still going to want to give them a test to see if they can do the job that you're, you're hiring for. It's important that it's just part of it, but it's absolutely a viable part. I love that as a place to end it, that this is an add on and not the, not the end all be all. What right. else is going on at the Evil HR Lady blog? I'm sure you've got uh, something cooking right now, Suzanne, as we speak. I do have things cooking. I have just read about the world's worst nanny job. And <laughs> you can head over to evilhrlady.org and uh, look for the, the nanny post. And it'll make your teeth fall out and also make you really glad that you're not a nanny. Um <laughs> because it would be well I'm sure there are some nanny jobs which are fabulous but this one is not one of them and I break it down as to why it's a bad way to recruit anybody not just a nanny that's that's crazy it sounds like it's going to be a job that makes me think that podcasting is fantastic and I love what I do now Podcasting is so much better (laughs) I'm not one to judge though about nanny jobs because I recall when my daughter was in daycare, there were a set of triplets in her class. And I said, what job do both parents have that they can afford daycare for triplets? And then I said, wait, if I had toddler triplets, I would work just to pay the daycare bill. Told, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, even even just having twins, Suzanne, look at what happened to my hair with twins. It's gone. That's right. So, yes. That's right. You so twins. Hair restoration. Don't have Can twins. you imagine adding one more to that? I cannot. I can't. <laughs> No, I no idea how they do. Of course, people ask us that with twins, like, like, how did you do it? And you just say, we didn't know any better. You know, I mean, it you was just do it. Yeah, it was what it was. Suzanne, yeah. happy new year or happy, happy slide new- into the new year and the yes. new decade. Yes. And have a good slide into the decade too. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And today we're helping you celebrate national have fun at work day. You know what I think about when I think about fun at work? Not being at work, am I right? But, uh, you know, since that wasn't really an option, Joe and OG would consider, let's switch gears from the roller coaster that is work just to roller coasters. Ready? Richard Rodriguez holds the record for the number of hours consecutively on a roller coaster. If he were cashing in personal hours, how many personal hours would he have had to request from HR to break the record? I'll be back with the answer right after I go ask Joe's mom if I can get some time off to go study for this blood test I got next week. Well, that might not be a thing, Doug, but we'll let him find out a little bit more about that. The score of this, by the way, Len Penzo leads with two. Paula Pant has one. OG doing the opposite of what he did last year. Uh, Starting off slow. You must have learned your lesson, OG, from last year. That's right. I'm going to come in hot. Which means you get to decide, do you want to guess how many hours Richard Rodriguez needed to ask HR for to break the record? Would you like to guess first in the middle or last? I'm going to go last today. Paula, you are second, by the way. No thanks to you. Big thanks to Gwen Mers. 
Given that I'm second, I will guess second. <laughs> she will guess second, which means, Len, you get to do the honors, my friend. Yes, imagine that. How many I, hours? How did I know I was going to be going for <laughs> Let me ask you this. So you're saying asking HR. So in theory, if this person was writing for more than an eight-hour day, I only have to ask HR for eight hours, right? But that, like, you see what I'm saying? It, it's That actually is correct. And we did not, Doug and I did not do the question that way. We thought it was okay, a, so. So you want me to ask HR for my <laughs> the time going home and sleeping and eating dinner and all that too? Which they would correct you, but we didn't. <laughs> why? Why, Paula? Did I have the engineer go first? Why didn't you say first? What okay, we- so if I have to ask HR for all twenty four hours for permission to use in the, every twenty four hour of the day, I'm going to say, my goodness, uh, that reminds me. You know, I. There's a big roller coaster, an old roller coaster here at uh, Magic Mountain, Six Flags Magic Mountain in Southern California called the Colossus. And one time, I was uh, oh, many years ago, around Halloween, they run that thing backwards. Have you ever been on a, on a oh, roller yeah. coaster backwards? Yes. Oh, yeah. my God. I was never so sick in all my, all my life. You just got no idea what the hell's coming next and oh, your my, neck hurts. I mean, I, back then, I could handle roller coasters, but not backwards. And, oh, my God, I was deathly ill after getting off that, that roller coaster backwards. Hey, Paula, they have that one in Cincinnati. Have you been to Kings Island in Cincinnati? I worked at Kings Island for Did two you? summers when I was in high school. That's of so course. awesome. What was the one? That, that there was the really old roller coaster where the, they ran one forward and run backward all summer the long. Racer. The, ra- the racer. The racer. Yeah, a, they ran one forward and one backward. That's a kick-ass coaster. Oh, my God. It's great. Yes. Great. Tons Can of fun. you run it backwards? Did you guys ride it backwards? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I, uh, uh, I still have nightmares from that. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, uh, okay. So anyway, so how many hours could this guy ride a roller coaster? I would say, shoot, I don't know. Did, did, was he allowed bathroom breaks? Was he allowed, or is this nonstop? No. So here's the deal. Guinness gave him for every hour he rode, they give him five minutes. Ah, okay. And, and 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 he could decide. By the way, what he did with the five minutes, he could take a shower, he could eat, he could stretch, I could do all the different things. Five minutes per hour that he rode take it whenever he wanted. And he was still was on it. He went between, by the way, two different roller coasters, one called the big one, the other one called the big dipper. All right. Well then I'm going to, heck, you could probably do that for quite a long time. I would say, I'm going to say 18 hours, 18 hours. Paula, what are you thinking? Well, so my thought process is if he has five minutes, a five minute break every hour, that is enough time to be able to go to the bathroom and to eat, uh, you know, at least just shove something in your mouth very quickly in terms of food, granola bar or whatever, or have, have a glass of water. And so given that he can eat and he can go to the bathroom, that means the limiting factor would be sleep. So the question then in my mind becomes how long could a human being go reasonably go without sleep? And I don't know what the answer to that is, but I would guess maybe 36 hours. Uh, Neo, no, actually longer. Let's make it 44. Are you speaking from experience? <laughs> well, no, I can just imagine being awake for 30. <laughs> you know what? I probably have been awake for 36 hours. Yeah, I'm sure I've done that. Oh, gee. I like Paula's uh, line of thinking here that once you eliminate the biological needs of food and restroom breaks, you can kind of just, I mean, you don't even have to be awake for a roller coaster, right? I mean, and, you know, on the food side of things, couldn't you just take a granola bar in your pocket? And Are, are you, know, you insinuating the, you can sleep on a roller coaster? If you are tired enough, my friend, you can sleep anywhere. Trust me. It'd be rather disorienting, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can. <laughs> I think you'd have the weirdest <laughs> dreams ever. You'd be like, you know, what kind of roller coaster is like the teacup where you're spinning around and you're going to pee every five seconds to close your eyes? Or is it like, you know, like a Millennium Falcon type thing? So uh, Paul was at 44. What was it? What was Len? What, what was 18. Yours? Yeah, I think it's going to be over 44. I feel like the number's like in the two and a half day range. So just because I can, I'm going to say 45. And so I'll take everything north of 45. And we thought the ghost of uh, Chelsea Brennan was long buried. <laughs> well, but she is the downside now too. So, so she can live and She does have the downside now. That's right. Well, True. we would uh, let you see if she needs it, but we're going to wait on that for just a second. 
All right, Len, you got 18 hours. You're almost a full day. It's in the bag. I've won this one. He's got it. Uh, Paula, you've got, uh, well, midway between 18 hours and 44 hours, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. I'm feeling good. Certainly, <laughs> I'm feeling better than than 2019 rules. <laughs> you do that's, right. that's right. Paula gets halfway between 18 and 44, she, doesn't she? She exactly. does. Oh, she okay, does. I'm not so confident. <laughs> oh, gee, you got everything north of 45. And I think the real number is closer to like 70 something. I think it's closing in on three days. Well, let's see no, what it is. Let's see what it is. Doug, uh, take it from here, man. What's the answer? Hey gang, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug back with you and hope you're all having more fun today than I am stuck down here in a basement with these dorks. Hey Joe, you know, we could at least have a karaoke machine down here or something. Ah, you know what? That might not be a great idea. Who wants to hear Len sing? <laughs> At least, uh, oh, but you know what? I bet Paula's got an amazing voice. She's carried the show so far until this trivia segment. Speaking of, today we asked this question in honor of National Have Fun at Work Day. If Richard Rodriguez, the guy who holds the record, had to go to HR to ask for hours away from work to break the world roller coaster record, how many hours would he have had to ask for? The answer, if you said 24 hours, you are way off because Richard might have done better asking for two weeks of vacation. Richard Rodriguez from the old US of A broke the record by riding the big one at the Big Dipper Roller Coasters and Pleasure Beach in Blackpool, England for 405 hours and 40 minutes stretching from July 27th to August 13th, 2007. That means he would have had to have asked for 406 hours of sick time, something I can't believe he or any human probably even has in the bank. See ya. No way. But what about sleep? I I, I challenged that. Ask and answer, Your Honor. (laughs) I think OG had it. I can't believe 45 is the closest. He's off by a factor of 10, and he still <laughs> is the closest. I, don't believe that. I can't believe that. I want to see video of that. It, it depends is. on what kind of roller coaster it is. I mean, if you're going like upside down, a lot of loop de loops, none of that. Yeah, you're not going to be able to fall asleep. But if it's just like a straight roller coaster, how is that any different than falling asleep in a car or it, a train? It, as soon as it jerks hard to the right or jerks hard to the left, I mean, you're it just depends gonna... on what kind of, I mean, is it like a kitty coaster? Is it top thrill dragster at Cedar Point? I mean, did I don't any know of anything you, about these? These are actually not huge roller coasters. I went and looked at them while Doug was coming up with this. You know what else is fascinating is that this is, have any of you guys seen that war, the, the Pac-Man war, where the two guys are going back and forth to break the world record of Pac-Man? It was this big documentary a few years ago. No, you're looking nope. at me Not like aware. you know. Nope. This was a similar thing. At the same time that they were doing this, there was another guy in Germany who was trying to break the record as well. So they were going head to head. And uh, and the other guy pulled out after a day and a half because he was dehydrated. So had it been the other one, one guy pulls out at a day and a half. The other guy goes 400 hours. Wow. 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 Hey, let's take out the magnifying glass and help somebody do better with their money. Today's hotline call comes to us courtesy of magnifymoney.com. When you head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, Len, you know what happens then. Uh, You get your money magnified. You do. You find out those financial products you use every day. You feel bad about them because they're nowhere near best in class. Over 92% of those products available, use every day available online and ranked at Magnify Money. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money for more. And to take a little break from what we've done historically, I thought it'd be fun to take something from our Facebook group because we have such good conversations in our Facebook group. By the way, if you want to join, it's uh, facebook.com forward slash I stack Benjamins. Nathan asked this question. Hello, everyone. With tax season upon us, I have a question about tax professionals. I've seen the same person the past couple of years from a major service, and I really like what she does and is fairly priced. However, when I was trying to talk to her about what I should claim on my paychecks to get less of a return, she didn't seem very knowledgeable in that situation, didn't really answer my question. My question is this, is a tax preparer not a tax professional? Should I be researching for local tax professionals to be more knowledgeable on what I should be claiming? And do tax professionals also do taxes for you? Are most fee-based and are they much more expensive than just going to somebody at a major firm or by having software? 
thanks in advance? This is a good question because it's that time of year. Paula, what are you thinking? So a tax preparer, like if you were to walk into, and I'm not going to name names for the sake of uh, not getting sued, but, you know, the big brand names of tax preparation, big box brick and mortar tax preparation. It rhymes with oh. Schmeich and Schmarsch block. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, gee, you'll uh, take I, that bullet. <laughs> can you give I me one you. more? Can you give me one more hint, OG? <laughs> mm-hmm. No, that's all you get. I really don't believe that you will get a lot of value out of taking your taxes there as compared with using software on your own computer. But if you have a complicated situation, and it doesn't even have to be very complicated, if you really have anything more than a W2, if you have anything that's other than super simple, I think there's a lot of value in going to a CPA because a CPA will be able to give you advice and a CPA will also prepare and file your taxes for you. But more importantly, or equally as important, they will give you advice and guidance about your taxes, particularly if, and it took me years to learn this, um, even though in hindsight, it should have been obvious, contact them in late November or early December, send them your year to date, like profit and loss statement for a business that you run, send them, send them all of your financial data for that calendar year up to that point, And then say, Hey, are there any moves that I should make in December prior to the end of the calendar year? That is how you get the most mileage out of your CPA. I love that idea, Len, the idea of a checkup before the year ends. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a great idea because if you think of a lot of things after the year ends, it's too late for that year. So yes, and I'm all for CPAs, by the way. I, 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 it's hard to beat a CPA when it comes to tax preparation, a real CPA. Yeah. Oh, gee, anything to add there? Sure. There's other designations that count as well. Uh, the other one that comes to mind is an enrolled agent. So that's somebody who's specifically authorized to represent you as it relates to your uh, taxes with the IRS. Uh, specialties matter in terms of, you know, if you're a W-2 employee that, you know, you've got one interest statement and a brokerage statement, you don't really require a specialty. If you're a small business owner that has a whole bunch of real estate investments, probably need a a little bit more specialization if possible. I'll throw a little bone to the tax preparer that you're using presently in that the W-4 for 2020 does not allow you to make changes to it anymore. So if you remember years ago, you used to say, hey, I want to do single and three or married and four or whatever, and that would adjust your withholding. Now you just check single, married, or married, fine, and separate. And then you can add stuff to that. You can have more withholding taken out of your check if you want, uh, but you can't necessarily do less. So, well, I guess if you changed your filing status on your W-4, that might affect it. But that old, uh, hey, can I do married and two, but I really got three, you know, that sort of uh, manipulation. Um, I've seen anyway, somebody might correct me if I'm wrong here, but... um, I've seen that it just is what it is now. So, yeah, for tax advice, for tax advice, I like the uh, CPA. The enrolled agent can answer a lot of uh, straightforward questions about filling stuff in, but tax planning, I think, is not something the enrolled agent does a lot of OG. I think this is just as true for financial planners as it is. Uh, CPAs. You're going to find some CPAs who are brilliant at having that discussion, like Paula said, in November. Here's the stuff you got to do. You got two months to get it done. Let's do some actual planning work. But you can also find a CPA that's like, hey, I just put numbers from one sheet to the other and sign your return. You know, you just got to spend some time interviewing them and see and see uh, what matches up. But I would start with if there's something going on in your world that is requires a specialization, try to find somebody that's a little bit more specialized. And like Paula said, if you've got a relatively straightforward situation, you can use an online program like the Free Tax USA program. Yeah, and for most people, if it's straightforward, uh, using software now is is the answer. I'll tell well, you. Well, here's here. I was gonna say I'll give you a little hint. The software that you get off the shelf or you go online to buy is the same software the CPA uses. It's, it's, it just say, doesn't give you the questions. Hey, it, let me say this, though, about software. Software's great. I use it. I've been using it for a long time. And my cousin, Kevin, who I talk about, he's a CPA, who, by the way, they are licensed to represent you before the IRS as well. Yeah, but, CPAs are, yep. But there are tax uh, software is not foolproof. I had I got an audit, or I guess, I guess it's a, I got a letter from the IRS 
a couple of years ago now, I had underpaid my taxes by $3,500 because of an error in the software for the state of California. The software company came back and paid the interest yeah. and penalties, but I was, I boy, that hurt. You know, you still, that was 3,500 extra bucks I had to come up with that I wasn't mm-hmm. planning for. You know, it just that it is what it is. But like I said, I, I'm not anti software at all. I use, I've been using it yeah. for, for forever. It's, I was going to say most of the, the, you know, the top programs all have guarantees that if they mess it up, which in your case, Len, happened, that they'll make it whole. But you're right. That still, when you get the letter from the IRS, it doesn't make it any more fun. No. No. <laughs> they never send you letters that are like, you did a fantastic job, sir. We really appreciate your hard and accurate work. Let, Best of luck in 2020. Letter your from friends. Letter from the IRS. IRS. High five. <laughs> yeah. we got they some of your money and you did it a little right. bit though because then it'd be like the chance card on monopoly you're like ah crap i'm going to jail <laughs> <laughs> you don't know like almost every irs one letter that you get is all they're always bad right yeah, yeah. never good ones so the irish should send some good ones from time to time just to keep you on your toes yeah just, just well just. i guess technically they do in that sometimes they'll send you a letter saying hey, you overpaid, and so now we are paying you that, back with interest. That is true. That which, has never happened in the history of mankind. I've had that, ha- <laughs> I had that happen. And then I get more worried, Paula. Did you get more worried? when you? I got more worried when I got that letter. I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> well, They're the really only, paying attention. The downside to that is that then the IRS will send you a 1099 interest form so that you can report the interest that you earned from the IRS the to the year. IRS. Yes. So Very now that's just yes. one more form that you have to keep track of. I was just really taken with the fact that they believed that when I claimed my uh, two pets. So that was cool. <laughs> but sir, sir you last year that? you had three dependents. <laughs> you, like one died. Yeah. Sorry. One. Uh, we put Fido in the dirt last yes, year. Yes. My, my child named uh, Fido. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that note in the Facebook group to join the Facebook group Head to facebook.com forward slash I stack Benjamins. Got a question for our team of crack professionals here head to, I didn't say crap professionals. I said crack professionals head to As in what they're smoking. <laughs> to, maybe not. Uh, head to, uh, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. That's going to do it for today. Paula, you were incredibly prepared. That was amazing. So prepared. More prepared than a tax preparer is prepared for taxes. (laughs) I hope not. However, you were way prepared. What's going on at Afford Anything? On the Afford Anything podcast, we have an interview with Jeff Chrysler. He is a behavioral scientist who talks about the ways in which we trip ourselves up when it comes to our spending decisions. What are our cognitive biases? How are we our worst enemies? And what can we do to save ourselves from ourselves? We also have an interview with David Stein. He is the host of the podcast Money for the Rest of Us. And he talks about 10 questions that you should ask yourself before purchasing any investment. He's such a great guy. Oh, he's super smart. Really good interview. Just And just a good man, too. Just a guy that, mm-hmm. that I really, really like. Len, uh, besides 41 uh, ways to make sure you never loan money to anybody ever, what else have you published at leadpedzo.com? You know what? Just for the fun of it, I ordered some Omaha steaks a while ago. <laughs> and then after I did it, after the fact, I'm like, you know what? Was this really a good deal? I mean, was it really you know, I, I forget what it was. I paid 70 bucks for some steaks. Anyway, so I went back and I ran the numbers based on, you know, what if I went somewhere else and got the steaks instead of Omaha's? Day? And actually, the answer was quite surprising. Oh. So stop on by, check out and see how stupid or how smart I was getting my Omaha steaks. I love how Len finds a way to get Paula thousands of dollars in sponsor posts from Omaha Steaks. <laughs> <laughs> passes it off as a taste test and <laughs> and he writes it off on his taxes at the same time brilliant oh gee what do you got going on this weekend my friend gosh i have such a funny story about uh, omaha steaks maybe we can talk about it a little bit later oh boy oh boy uh what are we doing this weekend um nothing i think this is uh that's my favorite you know, answer bu- yeah we had a busy weekend a couple weekends ago and uh, this happens to be like the next four weeks for me, super, super, super busy from a work standpoint. So we break everything down in my household into when is the next break. And so I tell my kids, hey, you just got to keep your 
together for like three <laughs> more weeks. You know, you got 15 days of school or whatever it is. So they've got a break around uh, uh, President's Day weekend, Valentine's Day weekend. So we're going to go do something. So we got to keep art together for like another two weeks and then we'll have some time off. That's, f- that's fantastic. All right, guys, that's going to do it for today. Thanks everybody for hanging out with us. Thanks to everybody who's left us a review of this year podcast. Take it from here, Doug. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take some advice from our roundtable team. Don't be ashamed or shamed into awkward money situations. Use humor, deflect, or just brush it off when someone maybe asks you a question you're not comfortable answering. Secondly, we learn you can use new technology like texting as a tool to either recruit or be recruited. But you need to write like a grown-up if you want to be taken seriously. LOL, BFD, KWIM, IDKWIM. But most important, if you want to have some fun, don't have corporate dorks like Joe and OG plan the fun. I better blow this popsicle stand and head down for some real fun at the Sizzler. Real fun means shrimp, you know, from a steak place. They're always the ones that make the best seafood. Thanks also to Suzanne Lucas, a.k.a. the Evil HR Lady, for joining the fun again. You'll find all her great advice at EvilHRLady.org. Paula Pant appears courtesy of AffordAnything.com and the Afford Anything podcast. Len Penzo, the captain of skepticism, appears courtesy of LenPenzo.com. This show is created by Joe Saul Seahide, produced by Karen Rapine, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and if you could only know what it really smells like down here. SB Podcast may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. Oh, gee, you got some Omaha steaks. I've never gotten to Omaha steaks. I've heard from people that got Omaha steaks, Len, before we go to OG. I've heard from people that have gotten Omaha steaks and they get just countless offers after that that do not stop and they can't get rid of the Omaha steak salespeople. <laughs> well, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I haven't had that problem yet. Didn't have that. Maybe. No, but hey, I'm just getting started here. So, yeah. When I worked at American Express, I was a manager and then they're, you know, vice presidents above us. And I don't remember why, but I earned some Omaha steaks. I don't don't know. Somebody sent me a package of them and it came to my apartment when I was uh, living in Michigan. But it came the day after I started a week long vacation out of town. So, you know, they send you the steaks in a styrofoam box, or at least they used to, with some dry ice or some kind of cooling mechanism. Anyways, there was like nary a packaging label on there. I mean, it, I think it might have said Omaha Steaks on there, but it was really nondescript. I get home, you know, whatever, a week or 10 days later from this trip, and I'm like, whoa, a package. And I open it up, and surprisingly, it was breathtaking how foul those pieces of meat were (laughs) after sitting out on my porch for a week or 10 days or whatever. Did you call them? It seems like in that case you'd call them. I did.
I did. I called him. I said, Hey, uh, I got this delivery. Yeah, I wasn't home. I've been home for him forever. Like what do what you know? And I bet they took care of this? it, didn't they? They did. Yep. Yeah. But I said, No problem. You'll get your order right here. We'll send you. Oh, that's you're cool. gonna be home tomorrow. We're gonna overnight them tonight. And you'll did they make you return the bad steaks? <laughs> no, yeah. I cooked them. <laughs> <laughs> No, I didn't. Best I just, weight loss plan OG's ever had. I, I couldn't. It's like right up there with coleslaw. I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't get them out of the house fast enough. That is, if you ever want to like clear out a room, open up a box of Omaha steaks that have been sitting on your porch for roughly a week and a half, and see see what happens. Paula leaves that around for when people ask, "Can I borrow money?" Yeah. <laughs> just a sure, second. It's in this box. Yeah, sure. Let me just serve you dinner first. <laughs> as much as you guys need. If you live through this, I will loan you money. Yeah, that's that gets rid of Len's forty-one point plan right there. It's like, unfortunately, it triggers a manslaughter charge. <laughs> it's so annoying. Can't believe it. Uh, uh, you know, we had today, obviously, being uh, have fun at work day. I was thinking about workplace pranks and and uh, some fun people have had at work. We had a guy when I was at American Express. OG and I telling American Express stories. But when I was at American Express, we had a guy in our office who would page himself. And um, this guy, OG, would sometimes work in your office too. Uh, mm. His name was Tom. And Tom would get on the... We would be meeting in, with clients talking about serious either asset allocation planning, maybe estate planning. Who knows what was going on in all these offices, maybe 30 financial planners. And overhead, you'd hear Tom so-and-so, line three. Tom so-and-so line... Oh, I'm sorry. That's me. And he'd, <laughs> and he'd, and he'd hang up and, and we'd all have to explain to our clients. Yeah, that's Tom. Yeah. So that's my boss. Yes. And he's crazy. And and he was, he was crazy and our boss. Uh, uh, I, Paula. Oh, I had a friend who at parties or at festivals, he would pick up a megaphone and he would yell out attention, attention. I need attention. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> I had a friend when I was in Texarkana who was in charge of maintenance at the tire factory. And he said, and Len, you'll appreciate this. There was an engineer who gave them hell all the time. It was always just cranky to work with and difficult on the maintenance guys. And, you know, the maintenance people at a plant, they have one of two things going on. Either they're working their butts off or they have to sit and wait for something to go wrong because they need the plant to keep operating, right? So they're sitting and waiting. So this guy was such a pain in Texarkana, only for a few days a year would it get below freezing. And on one of those days, after the engineer had been exceptionally annoying, they strung all the hoses together, took them out to the guy's car and turned on the water. And every hour in 15 degree weather, they hosed down the guy's car. So after an, <laughs> after an eight hour shift, they come out and everybody else has this light frost on their car and <laughs> Mr. Engineer's got like two inches of ice all over his entire vehicle. He, he also told me that his spouse had a, uh, uh, his wife had a, uh, bumper sticker machine, you know, that make these homemade bumper stickers. And he would leave the parking lot with I heart sheep on his bumper. <laughs> they just... <laughs> They had fun with this guy all the time. Len, you've got to have stuff that happens. That you, I, I can't imagine the stuff that goes on where you work. Uh, some of the stuff, I don't know if I should say on the, just because, you know, I get in trouble. Yeah. Uh, but um, one thing I can think of a long time ago, when I first started out in engineering, I, I took me a while to remember this, but I, actually it's pretty funny. There was a group of us young engineers, and there was this one guy who was kind of really – really kind of an oddball, one of the oddball engineers. I guess they're all, we're all oddballs, but this one was an oddball amongst oddballs. And what we would do is every day for about two weeks, we took his desk, we moved it to another desk somewhere in the building and we set up his office. <laughs> so it was like eight or nine consecutive days. He'd come into work. He would know where, cause we were in this huge, huge building with tons and tons of desks. And he had to go find his desk every day for about, it had to be eight or nine consecutive days. So, but we would just move everything is his, all of his pencils is all of his work stuff his calculators his name tag. Come on, come on. Who didn't think of this by the way? But I said, I, I don't care if they lay me off either because I told, I told Bill that if they move my desk one more time, then then I'm, I'm quitting. I'm going to quit. I'm, I'm 
time too because they've moved my desk four times already this year and I used to be over by the window. We did more than that. That's who they made Joe, the movie. You after. just happen to have that clip on hand. I just I I just know that clip well enough. I called it up halfway through his story. <laughs> I'm like, oh like, my. Just recreational listening. You're like, I was just listening to that right before we started recording. I, I, I didn't even listen to Len's answer, Paula. I'm, I'm, <laughs> you think I pay attention during this show? Paula, what are the papers? You must add something. Actually, it related to that office space clip. When I was at the newspaper, the guy who worked at the desk next to me, he had a stapler on, on his desk and I didn't. And so anytime I needed to staple papers together, I would go to his desk and I would say, excuse me, I believe you have my stapler. And it was just this recurring joke where I would do it over and over and over every single time I had to staple something. And so a year goes by and it finally comes out that he's never seen Office Space. He's got no idea. He didn't what the catch hell he's... the reference. And he just thought I was a giant weirdo. <laughs> no, which it turns out you are. <laughs> but not for that reason. <laughs> exactly. That is awesome. But you know, the guy that has stories, I'm sure, because he worked with a bunch of first year financial planners at one point is Mr. OG. I've got two. One is related to me and one is related to somebody else. So the one related to somebody else is there was a person who was in our office who was just an insane chain smoker. I mean, out of this world, could not go more than 10 minutes without you know, puffing on a pack of cigarettes. She's a new advisor, first year, and my friend is her manager. Kind of sort of drew the short straw, I think. But anyways, in the setup that we had from American Express was you didn't get to like practice on clients. You had to sit with the manager for years, year anyway, of all of the meetings. And you just like literally sat in the corner and didn't get to say a word other than hello and may I get you some coffee. So my friend's the manager. He's doing this meeting with new advisor and this family. They're in the middle of whatever presentation they're doing. And she says, hey, I got it. I'll be right back. Excuse me a second. And so she walked out of the office. And you know exactly where she's going. She walked around. Oh, it's better. Walked around to the front of the building where the conference room was and then stood in the window with her face pressed against the window, watching the meeting while like smoking like crazy. <laughs> Just like nuts, like just <sighs> so this distracting is, was this, this is your this is your trusted financial professional, yeah, with her yeah. face pressed against the window on the outside on in the, the freezing cold. can't hear a thing, not a thing, yeah, and that's you know in the good old days, you could actually smoke in your office, oh. yeah well, that would have solved the problem, oh my god <laughs> that, that when I was oh my God, that everybody smoked. Who were smokers, that was. Oh, my God. Can you imagine so, your clothes yeah. every day, Len? Yeah. I remember yeah. We, had, we had our, our secretary. Again, this one I was really young engineer. This was our secretary was right outside in this main, like a vestibule or whatever. And then all the other offices are kind of around her. And, the, and this one older engineer, he was right out, right next to her. His office was right next to hers. And he would smoke like a chimney. And she would just – and she was a non-smoker. Oh, she used to complain to him, you know. That gosh darn cigarettes, you know, put it out, you know, and the guy would just keep smoking, 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 smoking. Didn't yeah, care. I, yeah, nobody cared. Yeah. yeah. That's how it was. <laughs> Probably my favorite, uh, it's not a really a prank, but joke, I guess. When I was working with, I still work with this family, but the husband worked for a law enforcement agency like a federal law enforcement agency. And so he calls me, we're friends. He says, Hey, I'm in the elevator. I'm, I'm coming up, you know, I'll be there for, you know, he's coming up for his meeting. And I said, Hey, you want to do something fun? And he says, sure. What? And I said, can you badge the front desk lady and pretend like you're looking for me? And he goes, Oh yeah, totally. So, so he gets up there and he opens the door and he comes in and you know, he's, he looks just the part, right? Black trench coat. And he does the whole like, hello. Um, I am officer or so who's and flips his badge open, flips it back and goes, I'm looking for a, uh, and he gets his book open. He goes, Mr. Uh, OG, is that how you say that? And we got some questions for him. We need, we need to talk to him right now. <laughs> and, and I'm like walking toward, cause I'm just trying to see how this wants to play out. Right. And I can see the secretary cause he can't see me like the way that the angle was in the desk, but she can see me. And so she's, she's like got these like saucer eyes. Right. And she's kind of like shaking her head like, no, 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 nope. Don't want to go this way. 
<laughs> so she like, so she, uh, she calls my office and she says, Hey, uh, there, there's a guy here to see you from, uh, I don't know. He's got a badge and a gun. He says he needs to talk to you. And I'm like, uh, okay. Um, well, uh, tell him I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'll be out in a minute. And so she could see my office door. And so I grabbed all the papers off my desk and I just ran down the hallway, the opposite direction <laughs> and out. And then, and then and, 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 and my buddy just said, he's like, oh man, the terror in her eyes. He's like, I know what you were doing. I could tell what was happening. He's like, I could just see her going, I'm also going to jail because I'm somehow involved in this. And, you know, there's papers flying as I'm running down the hallway, you know. So anyways, we had a good time with that. Do you remember when you had paper bags and I was a box boy and they sent me next door to the thrifties. I worked at a grocery store. They sent me to the thrifty, you know, like the ice cream, the place yeah. that makes ice cream to get something called a bag stamper because they said, you know, you know, the, the logos that they used to put on the paper bags, yes. they, they said, you know, you had to go to thrifty to get the bag stamper because that's where the logos <laughs> went on the, and I believed them. And I went to the thrifties in my box boy uniform, oh, asked no. for the manager for the bag stamp. Oh my God. I was so embarrassed. When I worked at the restaurant, when I was, you know, 15, I was a bus boy and we played the same pranks on everybody. So I just got it. And then I was part of the club, but they had, uh, Mr. Iben Hade, I B E N H A D. He, uh, he ordered room service. He wanted just a plate of parsley. <laughs> um, and so you'd have to like go into the kitchen and be like, yeah, I need a plate of parsley. They go, you need a what? And so you're like, I have Mr. Hade in room 306 wants a plate of parsley. They're like, oh, yeah, he always wants those. And they're like, you. they told you not to, just, you just have to leave it out on the front of the door, right? You have to like knock on the door and then run away. Like he doesn't want to in, in, interact with any of the staff. You had to go get uh, the loincloths from some somebody in housekeeping. And they'd be like, oh, no, there's, yeah, we moved those. They're not in housekeeping anymore. They're over in uh, such and such a place. And you'd just be going all over the whole, this whole restaurant resort thing going, yeah, I'm looking for the loincloths. And they're like, oh, yeah, did you check housekeeping? Like, everybody was in on it. <laughs> Except the guy who was getting it, you know. Like, gr- was the did you check with the groundkeepers for the golf course? They Sometimes they have them over there. Like, all right, I'll go over there. You walk across the entire resort. Hey guys, they're like, yeah, can I help you? Yeah, I'm looking for the loincloths. Oh no, that's definitely in the kitchen. The kitchen, I was in the kitchen. Dude. You know, and, and just like you guys are laughing, eventually you turn the corner and everybody like, ah, Mister Tad, you been, I been Tad, wanted his plate of parsley in the loincloths. <laughs> oh my god. Uh.